stay in here with you, that is completely fine as well. We just want to give you that option. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. You know, before God saved me, my wife saw me cry one time. And we were high school sweethearts. We were college sweethearts. Um, I just, that's just who I was. And God saved me, and I cry all the stinking time now. Um, I don't know why that struck me as so emotional this morning. It's just when I think about what good daddies do. That's kind of the picture that I get. Matthew chapter 4. I'm, telling you, I'm excited about preaching to you guys today. Um, the last couple of weeks... Man, God has had me preach. I'm telling you, I have been so excited. The last couple of weeks, I've preached so hard. Somebody actually brought safety glasses so I wouldn't spit, spit in their eyes. Miss Ramona told me, she said, hey, I'm ready for your sermon. And she pulled out safety glasses and said, you ain't spitting on me today. Um, don't think I can't hit you back there. <laughs> um, I can. Uh, um, but anyway, <laughs> but you know what? Part of me thought, oh, that's cool. And then she also said, hey, I'm ready for your sermon and pulled out a pillow. So I'm not really sure how to take her. There it is, too. All right. Thanks for the love. Right back here. Um <laughs> But I am excited today. I don't want us to ever get to the point that we think that we have to have emotion for God to speak to us. Um, so today I'm just going to teach you, but I really am. I'm excited. I think this is going to be a fun sermon. Um, it's going to be fun for me. I'm a prop guy anyway. Um, these are some very, very, very practical, very practical truths that I want to share with you today. Um, and we're going to start in Matthew chapter 4. And we're actually going to finish this sermon. I'm going to finish this sermon next week. Next week. So today what we're going to preach about is effective fishing. Effective fishing. And then next week, we're going, to, we're going to break it down, and we're going to talk about um, fishing like Christ. Fishing like Christ. So we're going to start in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into, into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is starting his ministry publicly. And I want to be careful how I word that because we have no idea up to this point the things that he had been doing. They're not recorded in Scripture. But what we see here is the public launch of his ministry. And the way he decided to do that was to tell two guys who were fishing and also two other guys that were fishing right after this. So technically the first four people that Jesus called into ministry were fishermen. But what he told them was that if you come and follow me, I'm going to show you how to fish for people. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about fishing. And for me to, to make several of these points to you, I want to get more practical. So I'm going to talk about actual fishing first. And then after I talk about actual fishing, then I'm going to get into how we can fish for people. Um, I have to start by admitting to you that I am not very good at fishing. <laughs> to say that I'm not very good is an understatement. That would be like showing grace. I am a terrible fisherman. So it was just several years ago that really I got involved in fishing. Um, the church that we used to go to, Cornerstone, once a year, they would have a canoe trip. And they would go to um, Ronsifert. Right? And they would float down to Alderson on canoes. Guys like me, let me rephrase, the size of guys like me are not made to be in canoes. Especially when the other guy like you is perhaps even a little bigger than you are. We're not made for canoes. So my dad and my brother, one day we were busy, I was busy and I didn't go, but they loved to fish and they went with the church. And they got back and um, anyway, they told me that my dad just about passed away. He got caught up in a current. They flipped their canoe like literally 15 times. And um, but one time they flipped it, it was, in a, it was in a bad current and there was a tree along that went along the river and it caught dad right here. And so several of the guys that were more experienced um, went last. And the last guy who organized it, his name was Rusty Miller. He said, I could see him through the water and I couldn't reach him. And he said, Kelly, I'm telling you, I thought I watched your dad die. But they couldn't get him out. The current was holding him against that log. So dad calls me that very next Monday and he said, I need you to meet me over here at Oak Hill. And I need you to bring your checkbook. And I thought, well, that's never a good thing. And so I'm like, what's going on? He said, just trust me, I need you to come over here. So I'm scared the whole way over there, and I get to Oak Hill. I'm like, Dad, what's going on? He said, uh, me and you're buying this uh, whitewater raft. <laughs> and I thought, okay, I don't understand. He said, we're going to fish in that. And I thought, I know we're big boys, <laughs> and I know canoes are not us, but come on, this is overkill. So we literally bought a 16-and-a-half-foot whitewater raft to fish in. I mean, his near-death experience changed him, I'm telling you. So the first several years that we went fishing, in the middle of the boat, it was set up with oar locks. So there were two great big oars, and I'd be on this side of the river or oaring them, and Dad and Jay would be fishing, and I'd say, hey, well, the other side of that river looks really good. So here I go. I'd oar over there, then fishing the whole time. So here's my point in all of that. Jay would catch, that's my, my brother, Jay would catch about 30 fish. Dad would catch 20 fish, and I would catch a fish. And then I thought the first couple of years it's because I'm oaring the whole time until Dad redid the boat, and then we put a little electric motor on the back, and then I, now I get a fish maybe 70% of the time. Jay still catches 30 or 40 fish. Dad will catch 20-some fish. Ethan will catch 20-some fish, and I'll catch some fish. To their 40, I'm catching three, four. And at first I thought, Jay's just lucky. He's just lucky. These are a few of Jay's fish. I told him that he could be here to defend himself today because I'm getting ready to rip him, but he's getting ready. He's leaving on vacation actually this morning. Um, and um, 
And then after the fourth, the fifth, the sixth time, I thought, maybe there's something to this. So as we're fishing, I look over at Jay and I'm like, what bait's he using? And I'm paying attention. Then I'm like, what pole's he using? I wonder what type of line that is. And then he, I even watched the way he twitched his hands. And I'm trying to observe, like, through the, you know, the corner of my eye. I even considered getting one of them stupid haircuts like him because I thought, <laughs> <laughs> When I fish, when I fish, I say, if I were a fish, Caleb, okay, when I say, if I were a fish, <laughs> if I were a fish, and then what I'd do is I'd get in my tackle bag, and I'd say, now, if I was a fish, I'd eat this right here. I mean, if I were a fish, here's what I'd eat. So I'd get in my tackle bag, and I'd look in here, and I'm telling you, I got all kinds of stuff in here. I got worms. I got tubes. I got minnows. But when, see, when I, when I think about fishing, and I think about bait that I would like, right, like if I were a fish, here's what I'd fish with right here. If I were a fish, here's the problem. Fish don't think like me. If I were a fish, you want it bad, don't you? Huh? Y'all want it? You want it? Huh? Somebody wants this. Huh? I can catch one of you fish in here. Okay. Welcome to my world of fishing right there. I can hear Dave. Dave's one of my mentors. I can hear him already in my spirit. I hear him. Set the hook, man. Set the hook. I know, Dave. I'm learning. Here's the thing. If I were really a fish, here's what they hit right here. And I hate to show you guys this because y'all are going to go catch all the fish on the river. Here's what they love. They love these little green Cinco worms. So if I were a fish, you see, that's what they really hit right there. When nothing else is working on the river, they hit this dark green. This is like bad stuff for you. They hit this dark green, hook it wacky, and they tear it up right there. So, um, and then I also say if I were a fish, man, I'd live right over there. And I take my bait that I think they would like, and I cast it over there, and nothing. Nothing. If I were a fish, I would eat this. And if I were a fish, I would live over there. What's the point? What's the point? Three points. First of all, to catch fish, I have to use the bait they like. The last time I checked, fish don't eat cheeseburgers and candy bars. I don't know. Maybe I should try that. But I don't think that's what fish eat. What fish eat are worms. Recently, what I have learned is they love crawdads. This is what fish eat. And if I'm going to be effective, if I'm going to be effective at fishing, I have to use the bait that they like. Second, I have to go where they are. I have to go where the fish are. They don't live in houses. I mean, maybe they have fish houses. I don't know. But when I think and I say, oh, if I were a fish, I would live right there, we're complaining because our air conditioner is out upstairs. Actually, it's to the point, and our kids are so conditioned to this nice air conditioning, they're sleeping downstairs. Because that's a different, you know, I don't blame you, I would too. I'm not, I'm not, easy, Mr. Benson, chill, chill. That's right, fuss at it, Riley, let her know. Okay, um, but if you ever see successful fishermen coming back from an expedition, they're soaking wet because they've been in the water. They're scratched from all the briars everywhere. They stink like crazy because they're using live bait and they get all that icky smell all over them because they go where the fish are, right? I'm none of those things. <laughs> I'm none of those things. If the weather's good, first of all, I'll go fishing. And I'm going to get bait from a store because it's easy to get and it's cheaper. And I'm going to sit in a comfortable chair in that raft. I'm not sitting in a kayak. That's coming later. I'm going to sit in that comfortable chair. And if the weather's good and if I'm not busy that day, then I'm going to go and catch it. Maybe there's a reason I'm not an effective fisherman, right? So up to this point, the only type of fishing that I had done was bass fishing in a river. Bass fishing in a river. Davy Keith decided that he was going to take me fishing on a lake. And Davy is... Um, very, very successful. He's a very knowledgeable <laughs> fisherman. I, I don't know why that's funny other than I guess if your wife wants to laugh at you, it's okay. But um, Danny can fish really well. And here's what I learned about fishing on the lake. Fishing on a lake is different than fishing on a river. And my point in this, and this is our third point, is that we need to learn from somebody more knowledgeable than you. Now, I have fished on the river enough to know a little bit about smallmouth fishing on the river. I've learned a little bit. But when Davy took me on the lake, I started to learn a lot of different things. So, for example, um, the pound line that you use is different. And um, the bait that you use is different. So when Davy goes, he throws 30 baits at it. I'm throwing that worm because that's what worked one time for Jay. And Jay's the best fisherman I know at the time. So that's what I throw right there. So Davy's throwing buzz baits. He's throwing crank baits. He's throwing tubes. He's throwing worms. He's throwing frogs. He's throwing all this stuff. So through me going through that process, and Davy, would you go back to Davy's picture? So... When you look here at this one picture of Davy, he has on the one on the left, that was like the second time that we went. The weather was great to me. That's fishing weather. The one on the right, if you notice, first of all, the water level is way, way down. Can you see that there on the right-hand picture? So they had already dropped that down. It was unbelievably cold that day. 
And um, I thought, okay, it's cold and it's fall. So if it's cold and fall and I'm going to be outside, I'm going to be doing one of two things. I'm either going to be in a tree stand hunting deer or I'm going to be at a college football game. That's the only two knowledgeable thing people do when it's cold outside in late fall, early winter. However, Davy Key said, oh, this is a great time to go catch fish. So the next picture, if you would, this at that time was probably the biggest fish that I had ever caught. You can see I'm dressed up like Frosty the Snowman right there. And I was still freezing that day. It literally was like single digits, maybe in the teens. Um, I didn't even know fish ate. I thought they hibernate like bears. Apparently that's not the case. Y'all don't know. I'm, listen, we got to learn from somebody more knowledgeable. But, I mean, for me at the time, that was probably the biggest fish that I had ever caught. And then there's another guy. Would you go to the... Then I met another guy, and, and he taught me... He, he's taught me some phenomenal things about fishing. Y'all recognize this guy? Yeah? How many of you? It's this guy right here. Go to the next one. Yay! So Dave asked me one day, he said, hey, we ought to go fishing. And I thought, okay. And I told him right off the bat, I said, I'm not very good. I'm not a good fisherman. I'm just telling you. And he said, oh, I'm going to hook you up. I'm going to, and he's talking about this land of huge fish. And to me, that land does not exist. Um, and he said, oh, I told him, I said, I've never even caught a five pound fish. And he, I just saw him like light up. And he's like, oh, yeah, those are like babies where we're going. I'm like, listen, don't kid a terrible fisherman about something like that. So he picks me up the first time we go fishing and, and, and we're headed down there and he's talking about these bait and we stop everywhere. He's looking for a specific type of bait, which I never really heard of. I, can I tell him, is this like a total secret? Okay, it's a soft, soft shell crawdad because there's a difference between a soft shell and a hard shell. I'm not talking about Baptist, I'm talking about crawdads. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he's looking all over the country for this stuff and he can't find them. So he's stopping and he's buying shiners here and he's buying goldfish there and he's buying, then we go to another place and he's getting frozen shad and frozen bluegill. I mean, we show up and we got a truckload of bait and then he scores the soft crawdads like woohoo. So we go fishing and um, the whole time we're going fishing, he's talking to me and he's educating me and he's talking about the level of the water. What he said was, it's a good time to fish when the water's going up. That's what a knowledgeable fisherman says. What the novice fisherman says is, okay, when the water's going up, that means it's either raining or has just rained, and I don't go fishing in the rain because it's not convenient. <laughs> Maybe it's why I've not caught many fish. So he, he's completely educating me on the fact that when the water's going up, the level is going up, the water is more oxygenated. And also it brings in more bait for the fish. So the, the, the fish are much more active. When it gets, the water's going up, there's more oxygen, which makes it more active. And plus there's more bait flowing around. So when the water's going up, it's a great time to fish. When the water's going down, typically by then, the fish have gorged themselves and they're just not going to eat a lot. None of those things. I had never heard of any of those things. What I want to show you this next picture is just to show you the experience of hanging out with somebody that's more knowledgeable than you. The picture on the left, this is the first time that Dave took me fishing. It was a wonderful experience because we were on a boat. <laughs> so um, we went fishing and uh, it was a blast. He took me in a place in a boat that I didn't think a boat could go. And anyway, that was the biggest fish that I had ever caught, the one on the left right there. The fish on the right is still, because that was just a couple weeks ago, the biggest fish that I had ever caught. However, I want you to notice some stuff about the picture on the right. Do you notice that my hair is wet? That is not sweat. That picture on the right, my hair is wet from the water of the New River, also known as the River of Death. <laughs> That's true. By the I don't know if you noticed my shirt or not, but that shirt is soaking wet, as are my shoes and my socks and my shorts and everything else that was on my person soaking wet. You also don't notice the cut on my arm from going through the woods and the briars and a branch cut me on the arm, which if y'all want to, you can see me and I can show you my battle scar on my arm when we get done. I never even told you about that. You also can't see the cuts on my leg from flipping a stupid kayak in the river of death. I can tell you proudly, with my chest stuck out, that I outfished Dave McCormick that day. That's right. Now, the only reason that I outfished Dave McCormick that way that day is because in the river of death, when I greenhorned that kayak and I flipped it, flipped it over, I lost his fishing pole. So he said, he said, uh, hey, you go ahead and fish. And so he's sitting on a rock like this because I told him I ain't getting back in that kayak. <laughs> Which he had to go down the river in his kayak and get while I'm on the side of the riverbank thinking, uh, Jesus, you get me out of here and I promise you never have to worry about me getting in the kayak again. <laughs> Here's what I want you to notice about that. These by far are the two biggest fish that I've ever caught. And actually, the one on the right that day, I caught about three or four that exact same size, didn't I? They just didn't take great pictures because he was mad at me where he didn't have a fishing pole. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> Here's what I want you to, to, to realize about that. Dave took time and energy and effort and money to show me and to educate me on how to fish. So what I want to do today is I want to use some of these practical applications. I want to use some of these practical applications for us to figure out about effective fishing. I want you to remember Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon also called Peter and Andrew, throwing a net into the water for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. I'll show you how to fish for people. 
The reason that I brought this stuff up about fishing was to just get your mind wrapped around the thought that this is the way that we fish for fish. What does it mean to fish for people? I want to give you three points today. This is just foundational. And then next week, we're going to get into a lot more how-tos next week of fishing like Jesus next week. Point number one of effective fishing. Point number one, go where they are. Go where they are. If I'm going to go fish, I want to catch as many as I can. Amen? Somebody that likes to fish? If I'm going to go through the time and the energy and the effort and the expense to go fish, I want to catch as many as possible. Um, if we wait, I want you to get this. If we wait for people to come into our church to catch them, you're not going to catch very many fish. If I decide that I'm going to sit at home in my recliner, and if a fish comes into my home, and if the temperature's just right, and if I feel like getting up and going and getting my fishing pole and throwing it out there, then maybe I'll catch a fish. Effective fishing, spiritually fishing. I want you to get this. We're shifting gears. We're not talking about catching fish. We're talking about catching people. If I want to be effective at catching people, I have to go where they are. If you and I wait for a lost world, for an addicted world to come into our churches before we cast any bait in front of them, we will not catch any men or women of this world. We have to go where they are or we'll never catch them. Meet people where they are. Guys, listen, we have to meet people where we are. That's what I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. That's why in a couple weeks, I'm really excited, by the way. The first Sunday in August, you do not want to miss that. The first Sunday in August, we're going to dedicate an entire service to the changes that are coming in discipleship. We are really, really, really excited about that. Um, so that's coming the first weekend of August. Uh, we're going to introduce all of that to you, but I'm going to go ahead and don't tell Jeannie because if she knows, I told you this, she's going to be mad at me, and I don't like her to be mad at me. Um, so I realize she's right back there, Caleb. Thanks for ruining the moment. Can I just like a teenager? <laughs> All the parents are like, preach! <laughs> I'm kidding. I love kids. <laughs> I totally lost my train. <laughs> Getting back to it. Getting back to it. So the first weekend of August, we're launching a new way of doing discipleship that we're very excited about. One of those things that we're going to be announcing is Celebrate Recovery. So we as a church are starting a Celebrate Recovery. We at this point are just in the planning and in the leadership part of that, and we're going over that. Here's our issue. In the leadership part of going over that and in the preparing of going over that, it's growing already to the point that the place we were going to stick them upstairs is too small and we haven't even started it yet. We're talking about meeting them where they are. Churches are not going to be successful turning our back on the addicted and the hurting and pretending like they're outcasts. The only way we're going to meet their need is to go where they are and love them where they are. This is effective fishing and this is how you catch the keepers is going where they are. To go where they are, you have to meet people maybe in a condition where they're hungry. That's why we do the lunchbox. That's talking about effective fishing. It's effective fishing. So if somebody's hungry, what do you do? The Bible tells me to feed them. That's why we do that. It may be someone that is living in homelessness. Or perhaps somebody that's blessed enough or fortunate enough to just be coming out of homelessness. That is why we do the housekeeper's cover. Meeting people where they are. It may be meeting someone where they are, meeting them in a sinful condition. That's why we teach about, that's why we preach about the grace and the forgiveness of God Almighty in our lives. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That through Him, through Him, we have a way to the Father. It may be during difficult times in their lives. That's why we do the Do Something event. That's why we do the Hope for the Holidays. That's why, that's why um, not necessarily over, over hard times in their life, but speaking about meeting people where, we, where they are, that's why we were at the Friends of Cole over the last two days, just meeting people where they are. So over the last two days, Legacy, just trying to love on people, gave out over 2,000 waters to people. And if you can tell from the back of my neck, it was hot. You see that? Like crazy hot. If we want to be effective fishers of men, we have to go where they are and we have to meet people where they are. That's point number one and very, very, very important for you to understand. We were having church here one Sunday and the door opened and I happened to be right there and I saw the guy that married me and Jeannie 25 years ago. Actually, in about two and a half weeks, me and Jeannie will be married for 25 years. I know I don't look that old, but... That wasn't the funny part, yet. <laughs> and I saw the gentleman that married us walking through the door. This guy had been preaching for four, a minimum of 40 years, maybe longer than that. And I watched Bob Combs walk through that door. And it was great to see. Matter of fact, he looks the same as he did 25 years ago when I met him. It was Jeannie's pastor at the time. And he walked through that door. And as I looked at him, he literally, I'm not making this up. It fits the story perfect, but this is actually true. He literally had on a green leisure suit. You know what I'm talking about? Like the olive green from the 60s or 70s. I'm watching him walk in with the tie about that wide. And I thought, oh, my goodness, you are not going to like this. And he walks in, carrying away them preachers do that Bible about that thick under that arm. And he's walking in, and I'm thinking, oh, 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 I'm going to get the hammer when he leaves. 
So we go through the service and we get finished and Roger Lilly has the nerve enough to come up to me and say, hey, you need to go talk to Bob Combs. And I thought, Roger Lilly, how dare you? And then he walks me up to Bob Combs and then he really has the nerve enough to look at him and say, tell Kelly what you thought of the service. And I thought, I was not in my happy place. I'm just telling you. And here's what Bob Combs said. With a smile about this big, he said, I absolutely loved it. It's not, it's not his type of church. It's not his type of music. I wasn't wearing what he typically wears. I wasn't preaching out of the version that he typically preaches out of. But Bob Combs is so kingdom-minded, he saw a benefit in us doing ministry a different way. But the reason that I bring that up is for the statement that he made after that. He said, Kelly, I'll tell you the issue with most churches. And when a man that is dressed the way he's dressed, and I know his background, and I know what his convictions are, to see value in the way that we do church, and for then at that point for him to tell me, let me tell you the issue with most churches. He had my ear. And here's what he said. The issue with most churches is that we try to clean the fish before we catch them. We can't expect people to act like followers of Christ when they're not saved. We've got to love them where they are. We've got to meet them where they are. And we have the joy to share Jesus Christ with them and his redemptive, redemptive work on Calvary's cross. That is our joy. That's what effective fishermen do. But unfortunately, sometimes we get the attitude like this. There was a lady at another church that I went to, and I was a youth pastor at the time. And she came to me and she said, hey, you need to tell that person over there. She didn't know their name. She said, you need to go and tell that person that uh, he ain't welcome to come back here as long as he's wearing what he's wearing. This person was a teenager on a Wednesday night in the middle of the week, cared enough to come to church. Not only did they care enough to come to church, not only were they a teenager, they were not a Christian. Caring enough to come in the middle of the week to church. And beyond that, this guy, this guy walked to church by himself. And because he had on some hard metal shirt, they want to tell me this kid's not welcome in church until he puts on a polo shirt or something like that, we can't expect people to act like followers of Christ until they are followers of Christ. The first thing that we have to do to be effective fishermen is to go where they are. The second thing that we have to do is use the bait they like. I would take that candy bar and hang it out there, but somebody robbed me blind. That happens to me every time I fish. When I use live bait, they do. See, they don't care about my old cruddy bait because that doesn't catch any fish. They just look at that and giggle like that. The dude don't know how to fish. Throwing that at us. There's nothing wrong with tradition. Get this. There's nothing wrong with tradition. There, no, 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 no. I'm kidding. No, I got four in my bag for next service. Oh. <laughs> I was getting ready to hook it back on her. I thought, don't take that candy from that baby. <laughs> Braxton, I, I'll give you another one after service. You come see me. That's what you get, Mom. <laughs> Loading up on two candy bars. Dose. <laughs> uh, he'll be bouncing off these walls. I'm telling you. Braxton's not a calm kid anyhow. There's nothing wrong with tradition. Listen, tradition's a, a fine thing. But when we're talking about effective fishing, here becomes an issue. When we get to the point that tradition is so important that anybody that doesn't do something the way that I see tradition as wrong or sinful. Guys, listen to me. There are a lot of churches that present things as sinful and wrong that have no standing whatsoever as wrong in God's word. There, I, I'm not ripping. Please get me. I'm not a negative guy. And I'm not ripping on people. I, I love that there are churches that do it traditionally. I love that. I love there's guys that still wear suits and ties like Bob Combs, and preach out of that Bible with that stick. I love that. I have nothing but positive to say about that. The problem as churches is when we get to the point of someone thinks different, therefore they have to be wrong because I am right. Now, I want you to understand something. When I say that, we have to use the bait that they like. I want to preface that by saying this. God's word is the standard. End of story. If this says it's right, it's right. If this says it's wrong, it's wrong. If this says it is acceptable, then it is acceptable. It does not matter the opinions of people. It doesn't matter what social media thinks. It doesn't matter what the news thinks. If God says it's right, it's right. And if God says it's wrong, it is wrong. End of story. Legacy Church will never, ever, 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 ever compromise on the truth of God's word. Ever. Amen. However, inside of those parameters, I want you to get that. Inside of those parameters, we will throw the most effective bait that we know how to throw. That's why the first weekend of August, we're announcing the fact that we're changing up discipleship. Let me tell you, that wasn't easy for me because I felt like God led us to do something when we launched as a church. I just felt in my spirit God wanted us to do it this way. So now as I look at that, I have a choice. I can either hold on to my idea of what I thought and see it as ineffective right now or less effective. It's not ineffective, but less effective than it should be. Or I can say, God, how can we meet their needs better? So because we feel like there is a more efficient way, we're changing it up. And I'm telling you, you do not want to miss it. You don't want to miss that. So talking about using what is effective. God called us to love on two types of people. One, those who are hurt with church. Those who are ticked off at an organized religion or to those who have no clue what church is. I want you to understand that. Those are the fish that we're going after. So when Davey takes me, Davey Key takes me to catch a largemouth in those lakes, we throw a certain bait. When Dave McCormick takes me to catch a catfish or a blue cat or a mud cat, I don't know the difference. They all have whiskers. But when he takes me to catch one of those, the bait that we use is different. Okay? So 
We use a bait to be a fisher of men because of the two types of people God's called us to love. Those who are ticked off at church or hurt with church or those who have no clue what church is. So because of that, I want to give you a couple practical reasons why we use the bait that we use. That's why we use the New Living Translation. I prayed about that for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours over weeks and weeks. God, what version do you want me to use? The only thing, when you understand this, the only thing I had, I had ever read, studied, or preached out of was the King James Version. And I have nothing but good to say about the King James. It's still what I have memorized. I still study that. There are some beautiful, oh, I love the beauty. And it's almost poetic, a lot of the verses in King James. I have nothing but good to say about that. But because of the fish God's called us to catch, fish a people, we use New Living Translation. I preach in jeans on purpose. I prayed about that a long, 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 long time. God, what do you want me to wear? For some of you, you're like, well, that's silly. I'm telling you, we do church on purpose. We do church on purpose. I, didn't, I knew I wasn't going to wear a tie, but I really thought I would just wear like dockers, like dress pants and a, and, and a nice shirt. That's what I thought. And then I just felt God tell me, no, I want you to relate to people. I don't want to be the people. I don't want anybody to walk in here and look around and say, yep, that's the preacher. Because he's the only one dressed like that, like he's better than everybody else. I promise you that is not my mindset, and that is not the culture of legacy. We are a team. We do life together. We do ministry together. There's nobody up here. That's why we will never, ever do a pastor appreciation on a Sunday morning. It won't happen because we're not about a pastor. I mean, I appreciate the fact that you guys want to honor the position. I get that. But we'll never take a service on Sunday morning to take the focus off of what God wants to do as ministry and to put it on one person. It'll never happen here. That's the bait. Do you understand that? That's why we use this. That's why I wear what I wear. That's why we set up as non-denominational. I have nothing against denomination. I have nothing against denomination. But if God called us to love on people that are ticked off at church, let's say, for example, that we set up as Baptist. There's people like, nope. Those people have hurt me before, and I will never go in another that type of a church. That's why we don't set up as a certain church of God or this Pentecostal or Methodist or whatever. I mean, I have nothing negative about any of those denominations whatsoever. But we on purpose set up as non-denominational just so we can be more effective at being fishers of people. It's why we do the type of music that we do. It's why we do social media. I know for some of you that you don't get that, and that's okay. I'm not, I'm not ripping on you, and you feel like maybe we're, we're too involved with that. Do you know in church launches in, in new ministries within a couple of years old, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, the people that come to their church, they found out about them through social media. Not through all their marketing and their advertising, which is my college degree. My degree is in marketing and advertising. But there's nothing more powerful than the word of mouth. Amen? Nothing more powerful than the word of mouth. That's why we do social media, because we want to meet people where they are, and it is effective. That's why we do the coffee. It's why... Do you realize that we do hot chocolate and we do the juices for one purpose? Your kids. We had the opportunity to go into several churches and to observe, and I saw the coffee, and I like that. And, and I like that people can, you know, use that and, and go ahead and come in a little bit earlier. And hopefully part of that is so that you'll come together and fellowship, and you'll talk among brothers and sisters in Christ, and we'll do life together. But what I see in some churches is that when they walk in the door, the kids go over here, and the rest of the family go over there, and they're separated. I'm not saying that those places are wrong, but that's not what God called us to do. I don't want our kids to be separated from us as a congregation. I want them to be a part of us. I want to be in here, and I want them to feel important. And the first week that we launched to see those kids, young kids, walking around with that coffee cup, like, I wonder if people think I'm really drinking coffee. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. They felt so important, and just the looks on them. So we even do that on purpose. Do you understand? This is us casting an effective bait. Um, it's why I do PowerPoints now. I had never one time done a PowerPoint, maybe once or twice, in the 18 years I had preached. But I learned effectively that if you just hear what I say compared to hearing what I say and seeing what I say, how much more you will retain something that you see and hear. Um, and it's, uh, so I just want you to understand, I'm going to move on to point number three. I'm move on to point number three, um, is that we want to use a bait that is effective. Amen. Does that make sense to you guys? Never compromising. Understand this. We're not compromising. And let me just, let me just tell you this. For people to think, and I have seen this, I've seen this, it's been pointed out to me. So I want you to see this. And there's a picture of a church that's empty. And they said, this is what happens when you preach the truth. And then there's a church that's full, and they say, this is what happens when you compromise. Bull. Bull! What a cop-out. What a cop-out. You keep throwing the same bait you threw 100 years ago and try to catch people for Jesus in 2019, and you will have empty churches. Jesus used that analogy for a reason. The things that worked back then are not the same things as now. But listen, God's standard, His Word never changes. But how dare us as Christians rip on a church that's full because they're full and we're empty and we're doing it right, therefore they must be doing it wrong. By the way, don't let me hear you say that. Or in the most loving way I can, I will rip your hind end for making fun of another ministry or for condemning another ministry because they have more people. You preach God's word, I hope you have a billion people because that's more people that have an opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's not cop out on that. Point number three, learn from someone more knowledgeable. Learn from someone more knowledgeable. There are people here, there are people here that know more than you know. I'm not saying that we are filled with a bunch of experts. I'm not saying that we have people that are so much smarter, but there are people here that have experiences that you don't have. Maybe they've already been through a hurtful situation and they're on the other side of that. We need to learn from people who are more knowledgeable. I have caught bigger fish the last 
couple of years, I've not been fishing a whole lot, but the last couple of years, going with Davey Keith, he was, he was showing me how to catch fish, bigger fish than I'd ever caught, and then going with Dave McCormick, and I'm catching bigger fish than I'd ever caught because they took the time to explain to me. I'm so busy trying to catch Jay. He always caught bigger fish than me, but that's just because he's lucky. But um, I, I'm trying to observe him, but Davey and Dave took the time to explain to me why certain things are the way they are. Spiritually, for us to be effective fishers of men, we have to be around people that are more knowledgeable than us. Do you realize that's why your testimonies are so important? Do you get that? So there's several ways to do that here. One is discipleship, to learn from someone else. One is discipleship. I know you're busy. I know you're busy people. But I'm telling you, God will rock your world if you'll give him one more hour on a Sunday. For those of you that don't go to discipleship, by the way, I'm telling you, we're going to announce this the 1st of August, and then the second weekend in September, we're actually launching this. You do not want to miss the way God's going to do discipleship here. I'm just telling you right now. You're going to miss out if you're not part of that. We'll still love you. But you're really going to be missing part of what God wants to do in your life. One is discipleship. Uh, the next is life groups. That's a way to learn from other people. We have different life groups through the week at different places even. Um, it's one of the ways we can learn from other people. It's the reason that we do next steps. So if you guys would, in front of the seat in front of you, there's a next step card. And then right in this back corner, there's a next step station. After every service, we want to give you an opportunity to meet a coach or a mentor that's just going to help you and encourage you through life. As a matter of fact, yesterday I got a phone call from a guy who, uh, he's one of my kids. He's one of my students from years ago, and he still calls me. And, uh, and we talk, and he was just talking about how God's wanting to get a hold of his life. And I said, okay, fine, what's your plan? Don't have to have plans. I said, fine, what's your plan? He's like, well, I don't really know. And I said, you have to have accountability. You need somebody to mentor you. He's like, well, how do you do that? And I said, well, you can do it wherever you want to go. But at Legacy, we have a next step program and whatever. And in that conversation, he's, he's going to another church today. But he said, you know what? I'll be there. And he said, I want to go through that program. So that is there. That's one of the ways that we learn from other people. It's the reason why we do Right Now Media, for you to learn from other people. Over 10,000 Bible studies for you to learn there. It's the reason that we do the Bible apps. So you can have an easier way, a more effective way to get into God's Word. And, man, I'm going to I'm have to close for today. Next week, we're going to get into a lot more of how to, okay? How to fish like Jesus. But I want you to understand that for us to be effective, we have those three points, okay? We have those three points that we have to go over. Here's my question as you please stand with me. When was the last time? When was the last time you cast a bait outside of a church? Jesus said, if you follow me, I'll make you fish for people. When was the last time we out invited in the world? When was the last time we talked about Jesus out in the world? When was the last time that we represented him outside of a church? We can't catch fish if we wait for them to come where we are. How are we going to have salvations without inviting people that don't know Christ to come into a church? By the way, they can be saved outside of this church as easy as they can be saved inside this church. So I'm going to ask you, if God spoke to you and you need to respond today, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that. Are you a good fisher of men? Is there an area we can grow? Can we become better, more